Welcome guests to a conversation with President LeBlanc. Would you please welcome to our Betts Theater stage, the president of the University Student Association, S.J. Matthews, and the 17th president of the George Washington University, Thomas J. LeBlanc. Good crowd. Good crowd. Hello, President LeBlanc, and good morning, everyone. It's wonderful seeing you all here today. <laughs> yeah, so we are just going to kick it off. that work for you? Well, let me just first thank you for doing this, oh, SJ. Uh, SJ's parents are here in the audience. Thank you for being here, wherever you are. Uh, the, uh, the role of student association president is, uh, is a tough one. SJ works really hard at it. She's been great. I appreciate the partnership, and I appreciate your willingness to have this conversation this morning. So thank you all for coming out, and uh, let's give a big hand for the best student association president in the country. <laughs> Well, thank you, President LeBlanc. It's been an honor working with you so far this year, and I know we're going to keep doing great things. So we are going to start with an hour, a half an hour of pre-submitted questions, and then we want to spend a half an hour having you guys ask us questions. So I'll give you the sign, and feel free to come down to either of these aisles and ask any question you have for the president. But yeah, let's get it started. So my first question for you as the essay president, I'd like to ask you, what are the latest efforts to improve the student experience? Well, that's a great question, and you know that we've worked closely with you on many of these efforts. Um, when I arrived, I heard uh, from the students that there are things we could do to make it a better experience for them. And many of those comments came working directly with the student government. They came from office hours with individual students. They came from town halls. Uh, and they were great ideas. And I often say that those of us who work at the university know a lot about it, but we don't experience it as students. Only students really experience the university in that way. And so some of the things they were pointing out, um, I thought made a lot of sense, and, and we ought to just start making these changes. So we created a list. We have a whole initiative around this. Um, you can go to the Strategic Initiatives website and see uh, a comprehensive list. But let me just mention a few that I think are particularly important. Um, we just opened a new student services hub in this building that brings together in one place uh, the information you need for uh, registration, financial aid, veteran services, all the things and the services that you need at the start of the semester. It's not uncommon for universities to put those offices in different parts of the campus. And so students are running all over the place trying to resolve questions that are interrelated, such as registration, how does my course load affect my bill, how do I pay for it, what's my financial aid. So I think that was a great uh, addition to campus life. And in addition, we set it up to look like an Apple store. So you go in and you get service by signing into an iPad. Then you get called into the back where you can have private conversations. We have a lot of great services for veterans in, in that same location. And then at night, we can close off the offices and all of the other spaces available for study space for students. So I think that's um, one great addition. Uh, we also put an extra $10 million into our campus this summer. Uh, that was an initiative to create more community spaces to improve some of our academic spaces, to improve some of our student spaces. But generally, we're trying to create as many opportunities to create community as possible. Yes, we're an urban campus, but we're a community-based campus. And we want to create those spaces. So as you walk around campus, I hope you'll see uh, and get a chance to experience uh, a lot of those touches. Um, so that was another important initiative. This fall, um, moving to the academic side um, this fall, we have offered a course, Python, for everybody. Um, this came directly from the students. And interestingly enough, it came from our large cohort of students in political science and international relations and the social sciences. They realized that Python programming is a skill that can differentiate in the job market. And so we wanted to make sure that any GW student who wants to take Python programming can have it. And so we started offering that. This fall, also for the first time, under the leadership of, of the Elliott School Dean and the faculty, they created a Bachelor of Science track within the Elliott School. Now, the Elliott School has about 20% of our undergraduates, so anything that happens there has a big impact. And with a Bachelor of Science track, they make it possible for students to choose either a Bachelor of Arts degree in a more qualitative approach or a Bachelor of Science degree in a more quantitative approach. 
And the reason this is important is a number of students in the Elliott School want to do a second major in a STEM discipline. And it's almost impossible if you start in a BA track because you then need to complete 150 credit hours. And that's hard to do in four years. My guess is most parents would prefer the four-year plan <laughs> rather than the five-year plan. And so with the Bachelor of Science degree in the Elliott School, students can now enter the BS degree in Elliott and then do a second major in a STEM discipline without the five-year, 150 credit hour plan. And then uh, finally, the Board of Trustees um, approved, and this was an initiative led by the Student Association, uh, the students can take 18 credit hours for the full cost of tuition. Our policy used to limit you to 17 credit hours. Now, we have three credit courses, so if you have 18 credit hours, you could actually take six courses in a semester. We're not encouraging students to take six courses every semester, but it can make the difference between graduating on time or not in the later years. And the students made the case that that would be a good uh, thing for the academic progress, and we made that change. So these are all things that have happened in the last year, year and a half. Again, kind of in tandem with discussions with the SA uh, and other student bodies. Awesome, thank you for that. So now I want to turn to a question from our alumni. So why are you looking to reduce the on-campus undergraduate enrollment at the university, and what are the university's plan to ensure that a strong liberal arts education remains important and fully funded at GW with the increased focus on STEM? So that's a great question, and it's really got two parts. So let me um, tackle the two parts in sequence. Uh, first of all, what should be the size of the undergraduate population at GW? That's a question I've been asking since I arrived because a lot of the issues that we see around the student experience are directly related to the size of the population. And so wait times for student services and crowding in residence halls, these are all a function of the size of the undergraduate population. And in fact, we had increased the undergraduate population substantially over the last five years. And I think it put pressure on our classes, our facilities, our faculty, our services that have caused the student experience to be less than optimal. And so we looked at it pretty carefully um, in consultation with the Board of Trustees uh, and came to the conclusion that the best way to approach this problem would be to gradually over time right size the undergraduate on campus population. Uh, so that's, that's an effort that um, we're starting out. Uh, it will reduce crowding in the residence halls, it will reduce crowding around the financial aid office, it will reduce crowding for classes, it has a lot of positive consequences. Uh, and we're going to have to think very carefully how to do this because it has a negative consequence that you're foregoing the revenue that those students would otherwise bring to the university. Uh, but I'm confident working closely with the faculty and the deans um, that we can, we can manage that transition and create a better experience for the students. Now simultaneously, we're looking very closely at the role of STEM here at GW. Historically, our greatest strengths have been in the social sciences, in particular political science and international relations and policy. But we live in a STEM world. Uh, and if you look around, there are many ways in which, whether you're studying political science, philosophy, public health, there's a greater need for STEM education, and there's a greater need for informed conversation on campus that is informed from STEM education. So when we looked nationally at where we sit, and having already made a very substantial investment in Science and Engineering Hall, that is a wonderful facility. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go over and look at that facility. Uh, so we already made a big investment in the facilities necessary for greater STEM education. Now we're talking about having more students come here who want to study STEM subjects. I think it became very obvious that DC has historically been a government town, but that is shifting with the arrival of Amazon headquarters. It sort of put a spotlight on the fact that over the last decade or two, DC is evolving into a tech corridor. Those companies are here, they exist. Within the federal government, there are tremendous opportunities for internships. I just met a young man who's interned for several years at NASA, and now he's got a full-time job at NASA when he graduates. So there are a lot of STEM opportunities in society. There's STEM opportunities here in DC, and we think it's a great opportunity to broaden our application base um, for the students who are interested in STEM, um, to broaden the intellectual conversation on campus um, for students who bring STEM to the table. And it's not an either-or equation. This is not about 
ignoring our traditional strengths or even de-emphasizing our traditional strengths. It's partnering our traditional strengths with evolving strengths to create a comprehensive university where the intellectual discourse spans all of these different subjects, including the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, policy, law, media, nursing, public health, medicine. We want to be a comprehensive university that brings those conversations together. No, oh, absolutely. We also received another question from an alumnus. So to what extent is the strategic plan based on the needs and wants of a student body, and how does the Office of the President ensure student feedback is incorporated into this plan? Well, we want everybody's feedback, including the students. So as you know, um, I've asked you to serve on the university-wide strategic planning committee yep. to make sure um, the student voice from the formal body of student government is heard. Um, we solicited nominations from deans, your organization, and others uh, for students to serve on each of the committees. Um, I'll continue to hold office hours and feed information I learned from individual students into that. So students uh, will definitely be engaged, and in this case I mean both graduate students and undergraduate students, because graduate education is a really important part of our mission as well. Um, so I think it's critical for everybody's voice to be heard. Uh, we've created four committees around the four um, sort of strategic uh, thrust areas of the plan. One around faculty, one around undergraduate education, one around graduate education, and one around research. Uh, and we want to make sure that we have the proper representation uh, in each case. So I think um, we've done everything in setting it up to make sure the student voice will be heard. But I've asked each of the committee chairs to do outreach to various constituencies, whether it's in the form of town halls or meetings, um, giving everybody an opportunity to participate in the process. Great. And is there a way for people to put in their ideas to you and give you their feedback? Absolutely, we have a website, and so um, obviously you go down into the website, you'll learn a lot about what's going on in terms of the planning process, but there's also a place to submit comments that'll be curated, and that'll feed into the process as well. Yeah, and just students, or can anyone submit feedback? Anyone can submit feedback. Awesome, so you guys should all go do that. <laughs> so President LeBlanc, I have another question for you before we go to questions from our audience. Um, if anyone is starting to think of what the questions they want to ask, feel free to begin lining up on either of these aisles. But for right now, what are you most looking forward to this year, President LeBlanc? Well, I would say I'm looking forward to at least three things. One of them was this weekend. Um, we've studied very carefully uh, our Colonials weekend in my first two years and proposed a number of changes for this weekend. I hope you're having a great time so far. Um, I hope that the rest of the weekend will be a great time as well. Uh, we've tried to be very thoughtful and responsive to what we've heard from you in terms of the amount of program you want. Uh, one of the things that we learned is that many families come and they want to spend time with their student, and so we don't want to over-program you. Uh, so we, we took that into account. We're doing fewer events, but I think you'll agree higher quality events. Um, and so that's been a part of that. So this weekend, and I have to say, and I want to credit my wife, the weather's been fabulous. She's <laughs> <laughs> and I say that not just to stay married, but she actually, <laughs> my wife actually did study meteorology, so uh, I always credit her with the great weather. Um, uh, second of all, I'm, I'm looking forward to the strategic planning process and the conversations that um, that can um, create. Mm -hmm. uh, as I've said to the committee and I said in my town hall last week, GW has a strong foundation. We're in a good place. This is the best opportunity to think about your future. Because when you're thinking about your future in crisis mode, all you can see are the problems. You can't see the aspirations and the opportunities. And because we're in a good place, I think it's a particularly apt time to say, OK, everything's on the table. What do we want to be? Um, and during my first year here, together, uh, we developed a shared aspirational statement. Uh, we aspire to preeminence. That's a high standard, preeminence, as a comprehensive global research university. Now the strategic plan will develop some strategies for how we move the needle towards preeminence for GW. And I think those are really important conversations. That's why I hope all voices will be heard on that, including the alumni and the parent voices. So that's the second. Then the third thing I, I have to say, I'm looking forward to basketball season. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, we've done some things with the Smith Center to make it a more positive experience. We have a new basketball coach for the men. We've got a great basketball coach for the women. 
Uh, both teams are coming off uh, difficult seasons, but the injured players are back. They're practicing. They look great. I hope you'll all come out uh, first week of November and, and welcome the teams to the court because I think they're going to have great seasons. Fantastic. All right, so now I want to turn it to audience questions. Um, I do ask that you state your name and affiliation with the university, and we'll start right over here. Hi, so my name is Sarah. I'm a student at the Elliott School of International Affairs. Um, we've received this question from another student. It goes, how do you see university rankings as an indicator for our school's reputation? Do you believe that the university's rankings should be considered by prospective students as a way to value our quality of education? And what would you suggest we as students do to improve our rankings? So that's a great question, uh, and, and I appreciate it because it's, I know it's on the minds of a number of folks. And let me start by saying, I'd like to be number one in all the rankings. <laughs> or I'd like to be in the top 10 in all of the rankings. Um, there was a recent ranking of universities by how much venture capital went into their entrepreneurship program. We were number four in the country in that ranking. $800,000 of support uh, came in to fund uh, competitions for our students' companies. Um, there was a recent world ranking of all the universities in the world sorted by the number of unicorn startups created by their alumni. Those are billion dollar companies. GW was ranked 15, one five. Now that's a perspective, yes, thank you. That's a perspective <laughs> that, that maybe people don't always have um, when they think about GW. We're regularly ranked among the top universities um, for the political activism of our students. We're regularly ranked among the top universities for Peace Corps volunteers. Uh, so there are a lot of rankings out there that say great things about us. There are other rankings that pull together a number of these indicators and create a formula, and then they sort everybody by that. So a lot of people, when they say rankings, they're not necessarily talking about any of the specific examples I just gave. They're talking about the US News ranking. And the US News ranking is a formula. Um, and it brings together the factors that U.S. News decides are the most important ones. And there's two things to understand. Um, number one is, this is U.S. News collection of variables that they decide are important and that they weigh. And number two, they change it every single year. They have to, otherwise nobody buys the rankings because they're the same as last year. So one of the things that's happened is U.S. News has made some dramatic changes in the formula over the last few years, and those changes have disadvantaged some areas where we actually historically have been strong, and they've emphasized some areas where historically we've been weaker. So for example, GW has a great relationship with guidance counselors around the country. And every year we got great scores from them as a university. This year, for the first time, U.S. News decided that was not a part of their weighting. So they didn't include it at all. And so something we were strong on now disappears. A new factor that they introduced was what fraction of your students are eligible for Pell Grants. And generally, public institutions are much cheaper and have a higher fraction of Pell recipients than private institutions. But let me say one thing that I think US News gets right, and that is they have made the focus over time on graduation rates. We should be in the business of graduating every student who comes here. And on that measure, GW has significantly improved over the last decade, such that over the last five years, for the first time in our history, our graduation rate has exceeded 80% for five straight years. And our freshman retention rate last year had an all-time high of 92.8%. So my answer to the question is, every student and family will look at this amalgam of rankings and decides what's important. If you're an entrepreneur, a budding entrepreneur, who's interested in the Peace Corps and you want to make sure you graduate, we're going to look pretty <laughs> darn good. <laughs> All right, we're going to go over here. Please state your name and affiliation with the university. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Elliot Bell Krasner, Columbian College, uh, class of 2008. 
First of all, um, SJ, congratulations on your uh, extension to uh, the SA presidency. You come from a long line of very successful um, SA presidents. Uh, I think you're the sixth woman to be elected. And when Nicole Cap was elected in 2007, she was only the second. So a lot of progress has been made um, on the diversity front. So keep it up. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, um, two uh, questions for you that are semi-related. Since you're allowed to have an opinion about things, I would like you, in front of all the parents and students and alumni, to actually state your opinion as to whether or not GW should actually change the name Colonials based on the referendum that took place last year. Whether or not you actually believe that should happen and why or why not. And the second question that I have for you is, given some of the recent controversies involving Greek life, I would like to know, frankly, what efforts are being undertaken to be able to hold not just sororities, but also fraternities accountable. My understanding is that sororities are going to be having to engage in certain conversations and classes following the uh, Snapchat incident uh, that happened last month, but there is nothing that is going to be done with fraternities despite a long history of hazing and uh, sexual harassment. Um, so I'd like to know what is going to be done about Greek life as well. So let me start with the second question first <laughs> and, and, and see if I remember the first question by the time I'm done with the second question. <laughs> um, so we've had two Snapchat incidents of racism uh, in my time here at GW. Um, both of them emanated from sororities. Having said that, do I believe that racism at GW is a, a sorority issue or a Greek life issue? No, it's an institutional issue, it's a national issue. And we're working very hard to educate our students about how together we're going to create an inclusive community. Um, we have a lot of educational programs in place, we have diversity training programs, we have a lot of discussions, uh, we have diversity week, uh, we have seminars, faculty come in uh, and speak. We have programs, one of my uh, uh, programs that I'd love to see us grow even more is I'd like to have every freshman student take a tour of the African American Museum. I think it's one of the greatest educational tools for the uh, black experience in this country that exists and it's about six blocks from here. Um, I spoke with the leadership of the Greek life last weekend and the fraternities were there and the sororities were there. And I spoke to them about this issue because the immediate response is, why are you punishing us for the actions of one individual? We are not trying to punish Greek life. We're trying to educate every student on this campus about the very serious problem that we have in this country, in this city, on this campus, in Greek life, everywhere we look. I also met with some of the black student leaders at the same time. We have an opportunity as a university to create the kind of environment that role models how we'd like society to look. And we're working very hard to do that. Can I guarantee you that in the age of social media, this won't happen again? Absolutely not. I can tell you that my convocation address to all of the freshmen focused on building an inclusive community and the perils of social media. So we're working very hard to do this. Um, we're working closely with the student organizations. I will say that Dean Sissy Petty, who I know is here somewhere as well, um, has had the lead in the conversations with the Greek organizations um, on the role that they have to play. As the leader of this university, when something happens, people look to me for leadership. When something happens in the Greek organizations, we look to the Greek leaders for leadership. That's what it means to be leaders. Now, I'm going to try and remember your first question. <laughs> um, your actual opinion oh. whether or not you believe the name should be changed and why or why not. So this is an active conversation on our campus. Um, there was a referendum among the students. Um, and the rec referendum um, was to change the name. And I will say, first of all, there's some confusion about what 
the referendum was actually talking about. It was, and I know there's confusion because I received emails from alumni. Don't change the name of the university. That's not what the referendum is about. <laughs> Don't get rid of the mascot George. That's not what the referendum was about. The referendum was about the, the, the moniker Colonials uh, and changing that. And the referendum showed a majority, but a modest majority, I think it was like 55-45, of the students who participated would prefer that we change it. Um, I think that's an important data point. But as I said to the, the student leaders at the time, our community is much larger than the people who voted this referendum. And it's much larger than the students on our campus. So I believe this will continue to be an active conversation. I know SJ is, is I think, maybe doing legislation to this effect or mm -hmm. yep. um, something with the Student Association. Uh, it will continue. This is a part of a broader national conversation. Uh, I know there are voices out there that have drawn political lines already and said, you can't go here and you can't go there. And uh, you know, universities have these kinds of difficult conversations all the time. So I welcome the conversation. Um, I welcome to learn more about this. We have a, uh, a professor who teaches in this area who, who's written, uh, I thought, very interesting and thoughtful uh, editorials about this issue. So we're a campus in discussion, and I look forward to that. And I don't think my particular opinion is that relevant to how the university ought to make this decision. So thank you for the question. All right, now we're going to go over here. Please state your name and affiliation at the university. Good morning. My name is Sharon. I'm a freshman parent. My question has to do with housing. With the upcoming renovation of Thurston Hall and the requirement that students live on campus through their junior year, how do you feel that that's going to play out? Will more students be waived to live off campus? I'm just curious how this is all going to happen. So great question, and thank you, because it gives me a chance to talk about the Thurston renovation. So uh, how many of you are parents of freshmen in Thurston? OK, so this is for you. Um, when I first arrived, I heard that one of the defining experiences of GW education is living in Thurston Hall. <laughs> So I had to see for myself. So my first week, I said, give me a tour, a full tour of Thurston. And after the tour, I turned to my folks and I said, I don't get it. This is the defining experience of GW. <laughs> but for generations, it has been. Um, I go to all of the halls, but especially Thurston during move-in. Maybe I met some of you at that time. And just greet the parents and greet the students and get a feel for the vibe. And the students love it. And I met an alum who was moving in a freshman child whose room he wanted to go visit, and it hadn't changed a bit. <laughs> and there are members on our board of trustees who graduated 40 years ago who sometimes visit their room, and they haven't changed a bit. So I knew as soon as I arrived that we needed to do something about Thurston, because I did not believe that Thurston represented preeminence in, in freshman residential housing. Uh, so, so let me say there, there are probably three specific things about Thurston that I would have a problem with. Number one is we have overcrowded it. We have too many students in Thurston. It is not unusual when you grow the undergraduate population and you have a fixed resident stock that you start to take extraordinary measures. And in particular, you put six beds in a lounge and you call it a suite. Um, so that, that was problem number one. I think too many students in Thurston. Problem number two, we have not upgraded the mechanics of the building in quite some time. And those of you who moved in using the elevators know exactly what I'm talking about. But it also includes air handling, air conditioning, other things like that. So we counsel students when to open windows, to get airflow, and so on. That's not how a modern residence hall ought to work. And then number three, Thurston was designed for a different era and for a different student population. Um, we no longer uh, view these big bathrooms where everybody's kind of family together as the right way um, to su support um, the dignity of our students. So there's renovation ideas 
that I think will be um, much more receptive to the students that we have of today. The challenge for the university was, where do you put the 1,100 freshmen while you renovate Thurston? That was always the challenge, and I think it made it very hard for us to move from that gestalt to a plan. So there's two parts to the plan. Part number one is consistent with the earlier message. We will downsize the size of the freshman class. So part of the problem will not be here. It'll be a smaller freshman class. And number two, we're working very closely with our neighbors on a plan to reallocate our housing because I want to remind everyone, we not only have a headcount restriction in our plan with the district, we also have a residency requirement. And so we need to have a plan that is consistent with those residency requirements. And we've been working with the, the district and our neighbors on a plan that will keep the freshmen in the core of the campus, but will allow some upperclassmen to move to housing on the edge of the campus, including one Washington Circle, the hotel that the university owns on Washington Circle. Um, and so we actually have a full plan to keep people on campus. The younger students will be in the core of the campus. The more senior students will be closer to the edge of campus. There may be some relaxation on, on living on campus in the plan at the margin, um, but that's, that's basically how we hope to do it. Those of you who are parents of freshmen in Thurston today, this is the last freshman class that will experience Thurston as we see it today. <laughs> now, I do want to tell you, I was at an event to welcome students who'd been admitted to GW, and I was surrounded by five students who were so excited about coming, and they all pleaded with me, can you promise I'll live in Thurston? <laughs> and I'm standing there thinking, have you seen it? <laughs> but I want to say there is a defining experience at GW about living in Thurston, and I've really come to appreciate it. I keep seeing students going to Thurston. I say, do you live there? They say, no, but all my friends are there. It's where the action is. They see <laughs> students leave, leaving Thurston. I say, do you live there? They say, no, we're going home to get some rest. I don't know how anybody lives there. <laughs> it, it, it has been a part of our culture. We get that. The new Thurston, which we hope to open and we believe will be open by either fall of 2022 or earlier, the new Thurston will completely reimagine what urban campus living will look like. We will take the interior design down to the studs. We will build an atrium in the center and fill that with community space, bless you, that will be tiered up through the building and be visible from all of the different floors. It will make this historically large community a smaller, more intimate community where you can see colleagues and friends in these spaces. Uh, so the design, I'm very excited about uh, how we're doing the bathrooms, how we're doing the mechanics, um, how we'll do the rooms. And in the end, we will house a little over 800. I think it's about 830 students there on the same footprint rather than the 1,100 that are there today. So for me, frankly, that's one of the most exciting um, developments. And I want to assure you, we want to keep everything that is good about the Thurston experience in the new design and fix a lot of the things that I think we can all agree should be fixed. Thank you. Next, we're gonna go right over here. Please state your name and affiliation with the university. Okay, my name is uh, Glenn Chattel. I have an MBA with a concentration of finance and investments, class of 1997. It was actually called the field of instruction. I don't think anybody knows what that means anymore. Okay, uh, thank you for meeting with us today, President LeBoc. Two things. About three years ago, I was at the, I guess it's called the Science and Technology Campus in Loudoun County, Ashburn, okay? It's, it was a beautiful building. It was very underutilized, very underutilized. Um, um, I met a facilities manager, he showed me around. There were, there were floors, where it was nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, at the time, the school was renting space to nursing students from Shenandoah University. I'm not saying that's bad, but it seemed very, very underutilized. So I want to get to another question also. So I want to know what is going to be done to make sure that that campus is utilized properly. Also, uh, maybe... I don't know, three, four years ago, I'm, I'm at a reunion. I was first in uh, President Stephen Knapp's house. We know each other. 
I'm walking to a business school event in the evening. I see a number of students, and they're like selling cake. A young woman there, student, tells me that the school is not doing enough to help people with like, opioid addiction. So I want to know what the school is doing. Also, that, that's a crisis, obviously. I also want to know what the school is doing to help people with various types of mental health issues, even suicide. That is also an important issue. Thank you. So thank you. Let me, um, let me start with the Virginia campus question. Um, as many of you may know, GW actually has three campuses that we own. Um, the Foggy Bottom campus, we know and love. We're here today. <laughs> The Mount Vernon campus, we know and love, and SJ's mom is a graduate of Mount Vernon, so congratulations, um, which is out past Georgetown. It's about a 12-minute uh, shuttle ride. And then we also own the Virginia Science and Technology campus out in Loudoun County. And in the absence of traffic, that's about a 40 to 45-minute drive. In the presence of traffic, uh, you pack provisions and <laughs> you plan to stay overnight. Um, we, account, we acquired the Loudoun County campus, um, I think over 20 years ago now, when the internet was in its heyday and a lot of internet companies were setting up shop out there. And it was a strategic move. Uh, it was facilitated um, by some folks who helped with the land acquisition. And the idea was is that we would build essentially a technology campus right next to where this high-tech sector was being built. Then the tech bubble kind of burst in the late 90s, and it did not develop the tech infrastructure out there that we had anticipated. And I would say since that point, the university has struggled to find the strategic purpose for a campus that is between 40 minutes and three days um, from Foggy Bottom. <laughs> um, we've had several um, uh, attempts. We tried to turn it into a research campus. Uh, what we discovered is that faculty don't easily break their lives into the time they're doing research and the time they're doing teaching and other aspects of the university service. So you could only put sort of isolated research entities out there. Um, we've used it for additional space for personnel and, and functions that don't need to be on campus, so-called so back office uh, personnel. But we've also built a great nursing school education program out there. Um, not renting to Shenandoah. We are the largest degree completion program in nursing in the state of Virginia out in our Loudoun campus. We have a very successful online programs. So we have found an educational program that didn't have to be co-located here uh, in, in Foggy Bottom to be very successful. We are continuing to use it for uh, a lot of back office support. A lot of our IT professionals are out there. Um, there's a number of other functions like that. Uh, there is now, perhaps, a future boom in the tech space out there. 50% of the world's internet traffic flows within one mile of that campus. So the early vision, there was something there. It wasn't crazy. There's something there. But what we had anticipated hasn't fully matured. We're thinking about it. I don't have a, an obvious solution to that right now. I would say it's very functional right now. Uh, so I don't view it as a problem, particularly in the way it's supporting nursing education. Uh, but if others have ideas, I would welcome them. Um, there was uh, two more questions. Two more. Well, um, there was. Oh, let me. Opioid, opioid, opioid mental. Let, let me mention the, the mental health um, issue because that's really, really important. If you look around the country at universities, the need for mental health services is skyrocketing. I am going to spend Monday night and all day Tuesday with a group of university presidents tackling exactly that issue and asking the question, what can we do individually and together um, to help in this regard? Uh, it is a problem on every single college campus. Um, we need to make sure that students have access to the services they need. Um, we are now launching a search for a new director of mental health services. We're working closely um, to expand the availability of those services, including on the Mount Vernon campus, uh, as well as on the Foggy Bottom campus, and also looking at expanding the hours um, where that's available, because we understand um, that this is a serious need for our students. Um, so it is, a, it is a big problem. We're aware of the big problem. And we're aware of the fact that it is a national problem. And university presidents across the country 
um, are concerned about making sure the students have the services they need. This generation is under enormous pressure. Have there been many suicides on campus? Um, there has been some. The, um, there were a few that occurred before I arrived. Uh, I think since I've arrived uh, on campus, uh, I do know of one that was off campus. I don't think it matters whether it's on campus or off campus personally. Um, I've met with parents um, whose uh, children saw no other solution and, and have committed suicide. It's devastating when that happens. Um, so I think we're very, we're very aware of the problem and we're doing everything we can to address it. Um, o opioids, I don't have to tell, uh, tell you that this is a national crisis. Um, we're losing a generation of young people to opioids. Um, we have drug issues, again, on every college campus. We work uh, closely with our, our health professionals when necessary. We also um, work closely with our police. Um, we're not going to tolerate uh, drugs, illegal drugs on our campus. Um, but we're also in the education and health business. And we're trying to do everything we can in terms of education. It's a part of our student orientation, so people hear about it when they come here. We have a lot of services that are available to them that we try to educate them about as well. Um, it's obvious that when you take 18 to 22 year olds and put them all together, you get all of the issues of 18 to 22 year olds. And you're familiar with them because you raised them. Um, so uh, we want to do everything we can to make, make you proud in how we're dealing with, with your young people. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you. Please state your name and affiliation with the university. Uh, my name is Anthony Lyons, CES 2015. Might come as a surprise to some of you. Um, my question <laughs> is, Dean Dolling, the former dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science, constantly talked to us about uh, commitment to lifelong learning. President LeBlanc, early in your career, what was a mistake you made that you learned from whose lesson you carry with you today? Oh boy, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, it requires that I admit a mistake. <laughs> then I have to have learned from it. And at this stage, I have to have remembered it. Um, so, so let me admit up front, I've made a ton of mistakes. Um, and I do try to learn from them. And let me also say something about lifelong learning. Um, when I was first going to college, I think lifelong learning meant something else than it means today. Um, lifelong learning meant uh, live a life worth living. Constantly expand what you know, what you understand, what you can do, who you can talk to, where you've been. It was almost viewed as a luxury. And people, fewer people went to college. Now, I'm not that old. I was, the, I was the generation where a lot of people started going to college. The earlier generations, many fewer did. So a lot of my generation went to college. Um, but many of the ones who were going to college for the first time, and I'm a first generation student, many of us were going to college not for the perceived luxury of a life worth living of the mind. We were going to college to have secure employment and a better life for ourselves and our children than we, we were able to get growing up. That's why we went to college. And lifelong learning, as I said, it was almost, it, it sounded certainly to me like a bit of a luxury. Today, lifelong learning is not a luxury. You can see it today. 10 years ago, a statistic was put out that said X percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent of the jobs that the students will take in 10 years don't exist today. And nobody believed it because they couldn't imagine a world that could change that quickly. And now you look today, great for C's, great, great little statistic I heard recently. In 2011, the Washington Post employed four engineers. Today, the Washington Post, what more venerable organization do we have in DC that represents the power and promise of GW, has 300 engineers. And most of the jobs that are done at the Washington Post couldn't have been imagined in 2011. That's why they had four engineers instead of 300. I'm very interested and involved in data science. Nobody knew what data science was 10 years ago. Now everybody's talking about artificial intelligence, but that's an old term. Now we're talking about deep learning. Nobody knows what deep learning is. 
but there's all these jobs in deep learning. <laughs> I was talking to a, a community group and they said the most important thing we need is to get deep learning into high schools. And I put my head in my hands and I said they have no idea what deep learning is. <laughs> By the way, deep learning is essentially statistics. If you stand up and say, I want to get statistics in the high schools, they'll say, oh, come on. You say deep learning, how much? <laughs> so lifelong learning today isn't the luxury. By the way, there is a luxury aspect. I think the life of mind is great. I love the books that I read today that I never would have read as a young person. I read books on all sorts of different topics. Um, books people send me, books I read about in reviews. Um, I'm just, I'm gobbling up this stuff. And it's got nothing to do with my field of computer science. It's got nothing to do with higher education necessarily. So I really appreciate that aspect. But for young people today, lifelong learning means I can stay relevant in the job market. Because I guarantee you in five years, the skill set that I acquired today is not going to be as valuable. It's how many skills can I acquire in the meantime. Quick story, I met a young woman up on Capitol Hill at our annual alumni event. And she came up to me and I just said, recent graduate, I said, how are you doing? She said, great, today I got my dream job. And I'm waiting to beam with how GW prepared her for her dream job. And I said, what made the difference? And she said, I taught myself Python. <laughs> so the good news is we taught her to be a lifelong learner. I felt good about that. <laughs> the bad news is why did she have to teach herself Python? Because we didn't create open avenues for people to take Python here. We're fixing that problem. But there's an example of what lifelong learning means to this generation. Two years after graduation, I had to teach myself Python. Did my college education prepare me to do that? And in her case, the answer was yes. So I forgot the question, but that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we're going to turn it over here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jane Hudson. I received an MA in government from the old SGBA in, um, well, a previous century. <laughs> um, President LeBlanc, would you be kind enough to comment on the current state of the relationship between the university and the residents in the Foggy Bottom community? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Are, are, do you happen to be a resident of the Foggy Bottom community? Hypothetically. <laughs> I ask because uh, whenever people say, well, how'd you do? I always say you should ask the audience. Don't ask me. Um, I, I hope our um, relationship is strong because that's what I'm trying to do. Um, when I arrived at GW, I specifically made outreach to our neighbors to say, we want to be a good neighbor. Let's make sure we're always talking so that we're not misunderstanding each other and let's be good neighbors. I was told that the neighborhood didn't always feel that way. I can understand why. Um, DC has changed dramatically over the last 30 or 40 years. GW has been in the heart of the Foggy Bottom transition. So I can imagine what a lot of the issues are. But we're trying very hard to be good neighbors. Um, we meet uh, regularly with both the West End Association and, and the local uh, ANC. Uh, I've had the ANC to the house for breakfast to talk about issues. When we were thinking about the Thurston renovation, we had them to breakfast and said, here's what we'd like to do. We want to work with you to make sure that the way that we do this uh, makes sense for you. Um, we are a major research university in the heart of an urban district, in the heart of a community. Um, and sometimes we need to do things as a part of our mission that our neighbors might not like. I used to kid in my, my previous job, I, we were kind of a suburban university surrounded by hedges, and across the street were these million dollar homes. And the neighbors across the street didn't want us to be a university, they wanted us to be a dog park. And they would actually write to me and say, you're inconveniencing my use of your campus as a dog park. Um, and I got it. Um, I want to be a good neighbor. So when we talk about changes like Thurston, when they have issues, I, I walking the streets, I had a woman stop me this week and said, are you the president of the university? By the way, that's always the scariest question when you're on the street. <laughs> right? You could say, hmm, if I say yes, <laughs> but I can't really say no. She'll pull out a picture. Um, so I said yes, and she said, well, I live across the street, 
and I have this concern. And I said, boy, I completely understand your concern. I'm going to follow up my folks. We're going to do everything we can to fix it. I met another person, and they, they pointed out a concern. And I said, oh, boy, if I lived here, I'd have that same concern. We're going to see if we can fix it. What we can't do is say, we'll stop being a university. But what we can do is say, we're committed to being a big, good neighbor. And by the way, we provide a ton of benefits to our neighbors. I mean, we brought that Whole Foods to this community. <laughs> and there was not something similar before, right? Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, we help revitalize access to those foods. We bring events, a lot of neighbors go to our basketball games. <laughs> they can be cultural events. There are so many reasons why people like living next to a university. Uh, I met with uh, a group of neighbors, and there was a population of older Chinese residents living nearby who wanted access to the periodicals in Gelman Library in Chinese. And I said, boy, does that make sense? And we made sure they all got visitor cards to go to Gelman to read about news in their hometown in Gelman Library. So I hope our relationship is good. I know that there may be some historic mistrust, but we're working very hard to make sure the relationship stays strong. All right, we have time for one more question. No. So you're our last okay. question, so state your name and your affiliation. Hi, uh, we're students with a progressive student union here on campus. And so earlier today, you talked a lot about diversity trainings and really focusing on community. NGW's emphasis is on community. That's like one of his strongest points. Um, can I just do like a little bit of background for the parents here? Just so we can get to the question, so the question makes sense to the parents. Is that okay? So GW has two sources of labor, right? GW source labor and the outsourced Aramark labor. And now Emily's gonna give you some facts about Aramark real quick, and we're gonna ask you a question <laughs> about, your con about your connection with Aramark. Mm -hmm. So Currently, GW has a contract with Aramark this is a third party multinational corporation. Uh, also, Aramark has a food contract with a lot of for-profit prisons, and importantly, in our country's context right now, contracts with ICE detention centers. So my question today is that while we're trying to build community on our campus, why is GW continuing to be complicit in ICE detention centers? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me thank you for your commitment. Um, GW students bring a special pass, a passion for social justice, and I appreciate that passion. And so I want to thank you for that. <laughs> Second of all, I wasn't aware of, of the connection that, that you just mentioned. I will say that this university and many universities um, contract out activities outside their core mission. And our core mission is teaching and research. Um, now, the fair question is how you choose your contractor, what are the terms of the contractor, I, I get that. But generally, uh, I think it makes sense for us to focus on the things we do best, which are teaching and research. So I don't have a problem in principle with contracting out. And we do and should have standards for our contractors. And so I'm happy to look at the particular example you draw and ask the question, uh, how does it relate to the standards that we do apply with respect to contractors? Um, but I would say the general question of contracting, for me, is not so much the issue as making sure that you have responsible contractors um, who are doing the right thing. But I want to come back to the main point, which is our students are constantly educating us. When we talk about lifelong learning, this is what I mean. Um, and I take it seriously. And once again, I just want to applaud your passion on the subject. And let's continue the discussion. But I'll follow up on the specific example you raised. So thank you for that. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much, President LeBlanc, for being here with us this morning. And thank you all for coming out. I hope you enjoy the rest of Parents and Alumni Weekend. You did great. Yeah. Great job.